Oh, I have to be your pin. Did you pin and tie? Yeah. yeah, I just remembered. Ah. <laughs> that was painful. <laughs> Live, ladies and gents. Zach? Go, Mark. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Mendelson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Associates of Ben Gurion University, and I'm thrilled to welcome almost 100 participants to our third bi-weekly webinar Wednesday, as we call it. And we have people listening in who have registered from London, England, from Israel, from the United States, and from Canada, coast to coast, or as we say in Canada for my high school Latin, Amare Uska Admare, from sea to shining sea. So once again, welcome. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to say that we are also live streaming on Facebook. For those of you who are not uh, able to join us on Zoom, you can see us on, on Facebook. The format of today is that I will be introducing uh, our, our two speakers who are both um, in Israel. I, I, I mean, I, I would use the word legends. They're almost legends in their fields, I must say. Um, Professor Eli Lewis and uh, Dr. Uh, Nadav Davidovich. Um, who, by the way, has become a media star because every night on TV, almost practically every night I see him being interviewed uh, because of his expert in the field. I will introduce Ellie, and then Ellie will talk for uh, about 15 minutes, at which time I will introduce Nadav, and he will talk 15 minutes, and then we have questions, uh, Q&A period. The entire webinar Wednesday will take an hour at the maximum. So. Again, welcome and let's start. Uh, Eli Lewis studied his, uh, for an MD degree in Israel when he decided to gradually switch to an advanced degree in medical research. In 2003, he graduated from BGU, Ben Gurion University of the Negev with a PhD and his dissertation, forget it, involvement of graft derived IL-15 in transplant rejection. I know exactly what that means. He then completed his postdoc fellowship training in Denver uh, in the U.S. He established his research lab back in the his alma mater in the Faculty of Health Sciences, Division of Basic Research in 2008. He now heads the Department of Biochemistry and Pharmacology and heads the Wound Healing Hub Consortium, which combined clinical uh, clinicians, researchers, social workers, nurses, engineers, etc. He is a world famous researcher in the field of diabetes, and I'm thrilled that uh, I met him uh, quite a few years ago and our paths have crossed over the years that I've been working for BGU. I'm thrilled to introduce Ellie to our wonderful audience. The computer is all yours. Okay, thanks for having me. Uh, but we always have these plans that I show up in Canada and we do it that way. So maybe the virus has a good side and at least now we have some, some uh, channel to, to communicate well. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Actually, I think you did you did kind of give me a good pitch for the, the way that we study diseases in my uh, consortium and lab, and it has a little bit to do with diabetes and the virus, even coronavirus a bit. I think most of the, the listeners uh, are well read enough to appreciate that we're starting to see that the virus actually has uh, a small effect, but the response of the body is the one that's actually causing most of the damage. And that's actually been lining with uh, like an axis throughout my research in the past two decades, where we looked at diabetes, type one, and also type two. We looked at it as a condition where the body wrongfully attacks itself. And we always had this assumption that, uh, th that we want the immune system we want a very powerful immune system. We want it to attack viruses, we want it to attack bacteria, but the immune system is a very powerful weapon. And if you hold 
this weapon inside you, this powerful weapon that could reject a kidney or reject a heart, you should have actually have something in the body that also controls it and, and navigates it through these conditions. Because every infection that we have actually is, is inter, like, uh, in, intimately connected with our tissues. So the virus, the, the famous COVID virus, lives inside our, our lungs, inside our cells. Bacteria make their colonies inside our tissues. And when we attack that, we actually suffer the consequence of cells and tissue being damaged. So whether autoimmune, autoinflammatory, or just an infection, we had to assume that there's something that the body does to protect its own tissues when this happens. And we did actually find at least uh, one of several proteins that circulate the blood. They do that all the time. Every time that we, we're just awake, there's a set of proteins that circulates the blood to take care of the tissues. And it turns out that these proteins elevate several fold higher every time that we're sick, that we have a flu, for example, or COVID. So if you're infected, if you have the flu, your body turns gradually within a day or two to a more protective uh, tissue environment so that you can attack the pathogen better. We took one of these proteins, we put it in a bottle, and we started now to test it, giving it to people who may need it. In other words, when your tissues need protection, we actually employ what the body does when it's physiologically sick and generates these proteins. In other words, we're borrowing the wisdom of the sick body, in short. Uh, diabetes type 1 was the first disease that we entered uh, into this, this uh, very ambitious attempt. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that the third clinical trial has been published just recently. The third clinical trial proving that when we give this protein to newly diagnosed uh, adolescent patients with type 1 autoimmune diabetes, a year later, they have glucose values that resemble healthy kids. So that's a very powerful uh, uh, outcome. Uh, we have similar outcomes in bone marrow transplants. That's a condition where kids that have leukemia get a bone marrow transplant as part of the procedure to get rid of it. And if it actually uh, starts attacking the kid, we found that we can give this protein that the body generates and augment the, the capacity of the kids' tissues to protect themselves during an attack. And so you can, I, I think you can imagine the, the longer you take to absorb this concept that our body has a lot of power to fix and correct things. We just have to be aware of them, be able to, to harness them and try not to uh, inhibit them by various drugs. Uh, I, have, I have a feeling there's a question already. Is it just me or? <laughs> No, go ahead. That? No questions yet. Continue. Go ahead. Yeah, I know. It's, that, that's the thing. It takes a while for people to kind of get this uh, idea. So uh, I'll give you a very small uh, glimpse of what happens at the wound healing hub when we take this protein. We call it alpha-1. It's, it's a shorter name. And we start to apply it to different conditions in the hospital where uh, the medical practice actually causes problems. So let's just take a surgical wound. Everybody that needs a surgery, surgery procedure, a surgical procedure, will have a surgical wound. You'd like it to close. You want it to uh, heal faster. Apparently, we found a way that using this protein, using the body's extra uh, protective uh, condition, helps close these wounds much faster. Uh, the entire wound healing hub uh, is actually fundable. It's actually one of the uh, bodies that, that could be uh, granted money. It employs, like you said, Mark, several lines of professional uh, people around medicine. So it's not just physicians and, and researchers. It's also social workers, nurses, uh, families, patients themselves. And you suddenly realize that some of the unmet need in medicine isn't necessarily the most exciting uh, scientific breakthrough. It could be as simple as 
let's close the wound faster because when this patient goes back to his home, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of trouble and personnel to take care of a chronic wound, uh, to make sure it doesn't get infected. So we found through the Wounding Healing Hub that uh, being able to close a wound faster is actually relevant to almost all the departments, all the divisions. Um, in ear, nose, and throat, we have patients that have a tonsillectomy procedure, adult tonsillectomy, and they can actually, as a side effect, bleed through those open wounds. And this uh, medical need actually is very acute. And nobody actually studies just that little niche of closing a wound faster. For those doctors that perform tonsillectomy on adults, just the idea that we could spray this protein on the surface is fascinating for them. Uh, you move two floors lower and you have ophthalmology for the eye doctors struggling with dry eye, scratched eye, uh, foreign bodies in the eye, and even corneal transplants that are left with sutures that have to be removed at some point. All of those are starving for enhanced wound healing. And so from diabetes, where we think we promoted the healing of the pancreas, we shift to other conditions, and we think we actually have now the ability to address a lot of the problems that medical practice holds in it uh, as, as a compromise in uh, helping parts of the disease, but then actually causing more problems. Yeah. Actually, we, we have a question. And um, I have a child with type 2 diabetes. Should I be concerned about sending my child to school during these times post-pandemic or as we reopen the schools? Okay, that, that's, I'm glad this question came uh, early. Uh, and first of all, I have to, uh, to, to, be, to, to uh, claim that I'm not a physician. I'm just the PhD that, that's working on all this behind the scenes. But I can say, that people with diabetes, no matter if it's one or two, no matter if it's adult or young, are prone to more inflammation. Just, just that much more prone to more inflammation. And that's a problem because when the virus infects a person, inflammation starts to, to rise, local inflammation and then actually more systemic. In somebody who has diabetes, this could translate into a faster inflammatory response and a bigger one with more damage. However, I did read up uh, well towards these questions and there's no higher risk of infection. So just the, the idea of being infected is the same as every other individual, but if they're infected, then uh, the control of the infection might be actually harder and that's something you should take into consideration. But otherwise, uh, there's no higher risk of infection as far as we know now uh, from the uh, American Diabetes Association, at least. Another question yeah. um, from Ilsa Burns. Such great research. What sort of pushback do you expect from drug companies or from centers that rely on these drug companies to implement using a simple protein mm -hmm. and not a pharmaceutical? What is the situation on the ground, so to speak? True. Wow, those are excellent questions. I think uh, you prepared your audience really well then. <laughs> it is my sister. It's my she's my sister. I had a feeling she, she, that sounds familiar. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I sh feel that what we do in research shortens diseases, so we can shorten the time to a, a healing a wound, and we can shorten flu bout. We can shorten uh, these responses by using this protein. Probably others as well, but this one that we know of. Shortening diseases is, is a nightmare for drug companies. And I do sometimes feel like a walk around with like a small laser pointer looking for, I mean, what is he doing shortening diseases? But um, we want this to work. We want this to go very powerfully forward. And so what we're actually doing is uh, becoming attractive in a way that we can probably remove side effects of a lot of the drugs that are now uh, pretty common. So for example, if somebody takes 
uh, prednisone, cortisone, uh, uh, corticosteroids. Even a kid with asthma that takes chronic prednisone uh, knocks down inflammation and then also causes side effects. We already have some evidence that we could protect the tissues from those side effects. So in many ways for the drug companies, we're not replacing anything. We're actually increasing the, the potential uh, population target by allowing some individuals that would otherwise be uh, counterindicated or not eligible for drugs. A lot of the downside of drugs have to do with tissue injury, non-specific tissue injury. And that's something that we address. The body has been addressing it. We now try to actually uh, use it. Great. That's a very good, good question. Here's, a, here's another good question from Richard Levy in Montreal. We have read regarding COVID-19 that the overreaction of the immune system causes much of the damage leading to death by yes. attacking healthy cells. What does, why does this not happen with alpha-1? Wow, that's amazing, yeah. So with alpha-1, this, this one representative protein that we work on, uh, we know that the immune system is not paralyzed. The immune system can keep on working, but the tools of the immune system are shortened with alpha-1, kind of shortened by uh, their impact. So they will kill the infected cell but with alpha-1, they won't spread that to the rest of the tissue. Uh, the, we have a lot of fascinating- Ellie, research excuse me, we happens. have two minutes until we go to the dust. Okay, and, until I disappear. No, no. <laughs> Just turn into a pumpkin, okay. So uh, in, in uh, what we have left, uh, if you imagine, uh, let's go to the straight common sense. The body has been doing this throughout evolution. When you're sick and infected, it doesn't hold back the immune system. It actually just limits it and makes it more stronger against its targets. That's something that Alpha-1 is, is really good at, separating the targets from the innocent bystanding cells. And it's just been shown this morning uh, in one of the papers, one of the journals, that Alpha-1 actually inhibits one of the enzymes that these viruses use. So there's a lot of hope in that area. Simon, we still have a minute if you want a quick question. Um, there's a question about uh, the, what about type 2 diabetes and a cure for type 2? Easy question. No, oh my God, easy question. Mm. Uh, and especially <laughs> when I have like 35 seconds. Let's just say this, uh, especially f with the present time in mind, anybody who has diabetes, please try to control your sugar even better these days. Because the tighter you control it, the less inflammation you will experience. At least this way, I feel better that you can cross this uh, time of, of an infectious environment. Uh, just try to keep your glucose as tight as possible. And so nothing actually makes you more susceptible. We have, okay. more, we have more questions on this topic, but we'll let uh, Nadav do his presentation and then open up for Q&A for both of you. Okay. I will. I will now introduce Ndav. Yeah, we we certainly have more questions, and before I, I introduce him, first of all, Ellie, thank you so much. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I I I would like to thank my staff from across Canada, who were are so instrumental in making certain that our webinar Wednesdays are organized, take place. They put me through the uh, the rigors. Uh, they make certain that my tie is tied, and I don't. Uh, I'm sitting properly and someone said that I'm using my, my wolf blitzer voice. And I said, no, I'll use my wolf blitzer hair. Um, but really, thank you so much. Simon Ben Simon is the question answer. Ask Asker and Zach Ostrov is our techie uh, behind the scenes and the rest of the staff and the lay leadership from across Canada who are terrific. And of course my BGU colleagues. Now it's my pleasure to, to introduce Nadav who we really first met when I came to Ben Gurion with a team from St. Boniface Hospital. And we started a, an outstanding uh, cooperative uh, venture with them. Uh, Nadav, MD, PhD, is an uh, epidemiologist. And I think that the greatest uh, uh, advancement of, of COVID is that we're learning how to say epidemiologist. Uh, 
uh, and public health physician. He's a full professor and chair, Department of Health Sci Systems Management at the Faculty of Health Sciences and the Guilford Glazer Faculty of Business and Management at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. He teaches on, on health policy, public health, health promotion, the Israeli healthcare system, public health ethics, and global health. He's also affiliated with the Center for the History of the Center for the History and Ethics of Public Health at the School of Public Health, Columbia University in New York. Um, he served as head of the epidemiology section, the Army Health Branch from 2003, as the public health officer of the Central District of Israel. I can go on and on because they list his accomplishments, etc. cetera. Um, however, you're, you're, you, you're on the Zoom to hear Nadav and not to hear Mark. Nadav, the, the screen is all yours. You have 15 minutes and then obviously questions, and I will tell you when you have two minutes left. Uh, thank you so yeah. much, Mark, uh, for the invitation. And uh, Eli, it was a fascinating lecture, so I learned a lot. Thank you. Um, so what I'll do with you right now is the dance. Maybe some of you uh, were reading a quite uh, influential series of articles called The Hammer and the Dance. So The Hammer was a quarantine, lockdown. Now we are dancing because we are starting a way out of uh, all of the different uh, measures that uh, quite drastic measures that were taken. Uh, so when we're doing this dance, uh, I want to give you some of uh, our thoughts. I'm also sitting on the advisory committee for the government here in Israel and also um, in uh, Association of Schools of Public Health in the European Region Committee on COVID-19. Uh, and this is really very complicated uh, dance. So one of the most important thing to understand that uh, although in Israel and in many other countries, uh, we succeeded so-called in what uh, is sometimes termed as the flattening the curve. Uh, finally, we know at least in Israel and probably in many other countries that uh, we don't have now herd immunity. You are probably familiar with the term herd immunity. Herd immunity it means when there is enough immunity in the population in order to block a, an outbreak, an epidemic or pandemic. Uh, it's very different among different uh, infectious diseases. In measles, for example, it need to be more than 95%. It's not clear yet uh, uh, with uh, COVID-19 what exactly the percentage of uh, people being uh, infected, what is the herd immunity, but it's quite clear in Israel, for example, that probably right now, although we are, you know, in a very low number of new cases, very low number of uh, uh, people on ventilators, that's important in terms of the capacity of the healthcare system, um, but uh, probably the prevalence of the disease now in the community is uh, between, probably between five to 10%. Of course, it's very different if you are now in the neighborhood or you are in Deir el Assad, uh, places that uh, the outbreak was uh, much more uh, widespread. Uh, it's clear that we had a phase of uh, wide community transmission, but still probably we don't have more than 10% of the population, meaning that we still don't have herd immunity. On the other hand, it's quite clear that we cannot continue uh, in a lockdown of the whole country because finally public health is not just about Corona, it's not just about epidemiology. Public health is much broader. It includes the social, economic, and environmental and political determinants of health, meaning that if you are keeping the unemployment rates extremely high for a long time, we know that more than 10% of unemployment, uh, every 1% will increase mortality rates by about 0.4%. So there is a trade-off and the question of how you're doing the dance is very important. Now, I think that the measures taken in Israel uh, of closing the borders and later on moving gradually up to a lockdown, especially during uh, the holidays, during Passover, I think uh, they were very important, but it's clear now that we can uh, take more measures that uh, it's actually taking some risks. Uh, and the question, what should be our 
different set of uh, indicators to tell us that we are still fine and we can uh, continue to go on with opening the school system like we're doing now in Israel. Of course, again, doing gradually, we still, uh, le uh, the idea is to learn in small groups uh, with physical distancing. We don't like the term social distancing. We prefer physical distancing, uh, keeping hygiene, uh, masks and, and, and all of that. Um, so the government presented just two days ago some of these measures or indicators uh, and at least in Israel, this was not having more than one new, uh, 100 new cases in the community and no more than 200 cases uh, in a hotspots. So altogether, no more than 300 new cases a day. Uh, and personally, um, I was quite critical about it because I thought that we need many more measures and not just uh, Corona measures. We need to have measures that are related to the use of healthcare systems related to diabetes, for example, because you know people are still having chronic conditions. And measures about healthcare utilization, mental health measures, economic measures such as unemployment, etc. And having all these measures together will give us a much more comprehensive point of view. Uh, in order to see how we can continue uh, and getting out of uh, the current uh, situation. So we are quite lucky in Israel that we have a wide range of uh, risks that we can take because of the low numbers. Uh, but we need also to see how do we do the dance, not just on the average level, but also uh, in a much more differentiated way. Because you cannot treat the country as a whole. You know, there's always this joke about the person who drawn uh, uh, in, in, a, in a swimming pool that the average, uh, you know, uh, de death was uh, 30 centimeters. Uh, so, of course, you can have places like uh, Be'er Sheva or Tel Aviv or Haifa that with very low infectivity rates. And you can have places like uh, Be'er Shemesh, uh, Deir el-Assad, uh, Hura with a, a very high infectivity. So you need to differentiate between the different uh, places. So it's related to geography, it's related to space. You need to have a very widespread testing system. Uh, we have now a much better testing system in Israel using PCR, and I'm very happy that Israel will start doing serological uh, testing in about a week or two in order to see not just how many people are infected right now, serology is giving us the picture of uh, uh, what is the seroprevalence, people that also were infected uh, in the past. Uh, and this must be done uh, not just on the individual level, but also sampling the whole country in order to understand what is the seroprevalence. And other questions are related to question of health equity, how we're going to deal uh, with the ultra-Orthodox community, with the Arab community, especially now that we are uh, in the midst of the Ramadan, uh, there is lots of work that was conducted by the civic society. Uh, I was involved in what was going on uh, in the Negev. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that we have a very strong civic society, including the Bedouin Association uh, of uh, Physicians. There are several hundreds of physicians, Bedouin physicians in the Negev. Uh, there are many nurses and public health uh, Bedouin uh, people that are contributing to work with the community, religious leaders. So this was very, very uh, important. So in the coming months, since we still don't have a vaccine, there are several important uh, advancements here. Uh, some uh, with passive vaccines, like uh, creating a monoclonal antibody that was announced uh, in Israel in the Nestiona uh, Biological Laboratories. Uh, but we need to remember that these were not tested yet on humans. Uh, so we still need to have clinical trials. We need to have all the regulation, this will take time. And what is important now to understand that according to our experience with previous pandemics, it's almost clear that we're going to have a second wave. Now, this is not something to panic about um, because finally Corona will be integrated like many other coronaviruses, by the way, there are three of them at least that are appearing already for several decades. Uh, during the winter 
uh, as part of the upper respiratory infections. This new coronavirus um, is finally going to be integrated. Meanwhile, we need to take the measures that I mentioned going out of the lockdown gradually and having a very good epidemiological monitoring system that include tests, both PCR and serology, and um, answering the needs of the population, not just on corona-related issue, but also non-corona-related issue. So it means that you need now to take all the healthcare system, including hospitals and community and home care, and having a very integrated perspective with the excellent sick funds, for example, we have in Israel the Kupot Cholim, uh, and see how you answering the needs both of corona and non-corona. And meanwhile, of course, the high-risk groups are the elderly, especially elderly with uh, several chronic conditions. And, and this is also one of the mistakes sometimes because, you know, someone that might be over 70, but with no uh, health risk is in a much better situation than someone who is 45 with uh, four chronic uh, conditions, smoking, a uh, high BMI, uh, et cetera. Uh, so we need to be much more sensitive to the, to the differentiation of the people. And finally, I want to mention the question of uh, trust. Um, trust is very important and we need to be very attentive to the different uh, messages being taken. Unfortunately in Israel and uh, also in many other countries sometimes because of internal disputes within the government, and fights between the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, and other ministries. Uh, announcement about the, diff the new measures are being given to the public very, very late. And it's very hard to adapt if you get a message on Motsai Shabbat on Saturday night, that tomorrow the school must be open and you need to do this and that. And of course, the schools cannot do it. Uh, so many times municipalities uh, were against it and I totally understand the, the position. So the question of trust and the messages given is very important. We are now conducting a very large study that was initiated by Professor Golan Shahar. He's from the psychology department, together also with uh, Professor Limor Aronson. Uh, she is the vice president, but also part of the School of Public Health that I'm directing. Uh, Professor Itamar Grotto, the deputy director general of the Ministry of Health, is a faculty member and also a public health professional. And Professor Dudi Greenberg from uh, uh, Soroka Hospital is the chief of uh, pediatrics. So you can see such an amazing uh, uh, multidisciplinary group. Uh, we are funded uh, also by a special uh, funding that was given by the president, Professor Shemovitz. And uh, um, it's exactly what we need now, a multidisciplinary team. And we're doing already uh, eight weeks of uh, 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 surveys. And what is really unique uh, that we started on the time zero, before we had the first case uh, in Israel, and we are asking about um, anxiety, we are asking about um, resilience, both individual and community resilience, and we ask about trust of the government and the Ministry of Health, and then we try to correlate it with uh, how, uh, what is the compliance and adherence to the different uh, measures. And what we saw, and this is really interesting because it's not usually reflected in the media, that the Israelis are not panicking. There is some anxiety, uh, there was a, a, some growth and then habituation. Um, and again, we started from uh, time zero before we had the first cases. This is very unique. We sent an article to Lancet just a few days ago. We are, Ellie, keep your finger crossed that uh, we'll get at least to the review. Uh, but if not, probably it will be moved to Lancet uh, Psychology. It's also very prestigious. Um, and also what we saw, and it's interesting, that there is a, a difference between the younger and elderly population. So I won't go now into a quiz what you think, uh, who is more anxious. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that although the elderly population, uh, uh, the mortality rates is higher, um, we see that... Uh, the younger population is more anxious. Uh, and this is interesting and there are different reasons why. Uh, first of all, because there is also the economic component and, and many of the younger population, especially 18 to 30, uh, you know, got into unemployment. And, and also maybe the older population 
are much used to the age, you know, in the 50s or 40s, where uh, infectious disease pandemics, you remember, of course, polio, uh, smallpox, and other things that were more common. So maybe they see corona, uh, you know, with a different uh, perspective than the younger uh, population. And also what is interesting, that we found a gender difference. Uh, women are slightly more anxious than men. Uh, and here it's also interesting because we know that men have higher mortality rates, but we know the other hand that in terms of morbidity, uh, women now are suffering because of the stress, because many times uh, the burden of uh, taking care of the family is on women. And many times uh, there are those who uh, need to stay at home, um, etc. So we have lots of very interesting uh, information. And this is very important to inform decision makers because we are going to continue this dance for a long time. And the question of trust, the question of um, resilience, I didn't mention that communities that were found to be more resilient also were less anxious and, and more compliant. So these things are very important in order to get the, uh, the, the right messages that are appropriate to the targeted also to the specific uh, uh, groups. So just to finish uh, the next uh, 30 seconds or so, Mark, um, we know that there are lots of differences between countries and we need to remember that we are only in the midst of the pandemic. It's very hard to tell why are those differences. Some of them are related to demography. Some of them are related to the measures that were taken. Some of them are related maybe to climate. It's still an open question, but it's quite clear that uh, we need to go back to relatively normal life. We need to do it in a uh, in a cautious manner, uh, and we need to prepare ourselves for probably what would be the second way, but not to panic, just to prepare ourselves and create set of uh, indicators that are not just about corona, but also about uh, other aspects uh, such as chronic diseases, such as mental health, uh, and be very aware about uh, issues of uh, health equity. Thank you. The Dove, terrific, thank you so much. And it's obviously terrific, not only to me, but to the listening audience, because we have about 15 questions already. Uh, we have exactly 20 minutes uh, before we finish, 21 minutes. So Simon, the, the questioner, uh, the floor is yours, and you can ask both Nadav and Ellie uh, what you need to. Thank you very much. Ellie, to turn on your microphone, please. Okay, so we... We, we have a few more questions for, for Ellie. Um, from um, Howard Mori in Winnipeg, uh, he's interested in knowing what kind of formal research uh, relationships uh, do you have between your lab and other institutions uh, around the world and uh, in North America? Oh, wow. Uh, we don't have enough time for that, <laughs> seriously. Research today is much bigger than one lab, a lot bigger than one lab. And uh, we work with so many countries in, in Europe and, and America, and uh, we have even several friends in Canada that we work with in Vancouver, Toronto. Uh, it, it takes more than one lab, and, and especially when the research is so far reaching in, in different uh, uh, directions of disease. Great. Uh, yeah. So we're going to, I'm going to ask you two um, specific questions. So one from uh, Toronto, Rachel Goodman Athler, um, and she says, hi, my almost 16 year old son was diagnosed one year ago with T1D. We have been told by his medical team that he is not at greater risk of developing COVID-19 since he is a child or that he did, or that if he did catch it, he would not be very high risk of doing poorly other than of course, having to monitor his sugars. Do you agree with that assessment? Okay, well, um, T1D is, is, stands for type 1 autoimmune diabetes. And uh, we do know that the, the more that you control the sugar, then the more you resemble uh, an other individual without type 1 diabetes. So I do agree uh, because today's tools and technology to keep sugar flat are actually very impressive. It's, it doesn't say that it's easy. There's also um, a little bit of insulin resistance every time that we're sick. So it makes it even harder. 
but I have a feeling that, that your kid is in good hands, especially his parents. Right. Thank you. Yeah, Question from uh, Peggy Cohen Rabinovich in Montreal. Once a patient has type one diabetes, does the alpha one protein prevent insulin dependency? But you mean, well, it's not, a, uh, I can't discuss it, but uh, by treating, you mean treatment. So the first thing that we found was that patients with diabetes that came in to the trials, all of them had, with no exception, an inactivated alpha-1. It's inactivated by the sugar. So in other words, they're, they're actually walking around with alpha-1 of their own, but it's, it's uh, blunted and, and non-active because sugar sticks to these proteins. By giving alpha-1, we found that first of all, we restore the functionality. So suddenly there, there's at least the capacity to repair tissues and so on. Um, it's hard to say whether we reversed processes, but it does look like 100 days from diagnosis. So three months from diagnosis, the pancreas is still uh, an organ that looks like a wounded organ that needs repair. There, we think we have a lot of um, potential, but I wouldn't generalize and I can't say that just giving it helps everyone. Uh, we, we're still learning when, when is the optimal time. Uh, Nadav, please turn on your microphone. <laughs> so I have two questions that are related and related to both of you, actually. Um, and I'll read the, one of them. Uh, I am a healthy 46-year-old type 1 diabetic. I work from home normally, have been physically distancing along with my family for the last two months. Once they start to move back into the world, how should I handle being in the same house with them? Do I need to quarantine from them? And the other related question is that the person is a 70 year old uh, diabetic and is also concerned as a diabetic about uh, the reintegration and the opening up of uh, back to normal life as we try to, to do. Um, so I can send, uh, Simon and Mark, I can send you uh, the studies that were conducted in Israel. Uh, it's actually done uh, mainly by Professor Ron Balliser. Uh, he's um, also a faculty at the School of Public Health and also director of the Klalit uh, Innovation uh, Center. Um, and what they did, they, they took all the data, uh, in Israel at least, uh, showing that it's not only about age, it's also they gave us several points that everyone can uh, ask uh, and see yourself. So I prefer to send uh, these uh, measures because you are acquiring points. And let's say that you are someone who is uh, older than 70 and have these four, po four points, for example, that might include you know, smoking uh, more than 10 years, uh, being hospitalized in the last year, um, having um, this and that. And, and so if you have more than four points, it's better for you to be very cautious and, and uh, stay most time at home. Uh, if you have less, uh, you can be uh, more, you know, uh, open in terms of, of your activities. If you are less than 50 years old and only have, for example, one point. So let's say you are diabetic and uh, you're now 40 years old and uh, your diabetes is under control. So you need to do what uh, all people are doing. I mean, Again, keeping the physical distance, uh, wearing a mask, washing hands, but, but you, you can go, you can go out, outside. And by the way, we need to remember, and I'm sure that Ellie knows much more than I know, uh, because there's more experience that, uh, of course, uh, the other things are going on out there, you know, uh, about the immune system, diabetes, and the being prone, I don't know, to influenza or upper respiratory. So we need to take everything. Uh, it's not a black and white. So uh, Mark, I can send you uh, this kind because it's better for yeah. everyone to do like a list of uh, what are the risk factors. And uh, it was uh, tested on uh, or calibrated by Kralit Health Services. They insure uh, four and a half million people. They have uh, lots of data. Uh, so it's quite uh, solid uh, right, uh, right now. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it was presented last night on Israeli news. Uh, yes. We saw the list. Uh, it was Danny Kushmaro is one I was thinking about. Um, and if you send it to uh, me and Simon, we will send it to all the participants today. 
Great. Perfect. Thank you. A uh, question from uh, Adam Corbin in Vancouver for Nadav. How many people need to be tested for you to be satisfied with the seroprevalence numbers? So uh, some of my best friends now are working on that. Um, um, they decided that there'll be about 100,000 um, serological tests uh, conducted uh, around the, the country. Uh, this is probably more than enough. Israel was lucky to buy quite early in the pandemic uh, 2.4 2 million uh, serological tests from Abbott. Uh, then they were not still approved, now they are FDA approved. But still things are now uh, under investigation because you need to calibrate and see what is the uh, the, specific, the, the sensitivity, specificity, a positive predictive value, all different epidemiological measures that are conducted by uh, on, on now on the pilot group together with the PCR to see um, uh, how you can uh, do the, the calibration. Uh, and then uh, we know much better what is the actual seroprevalence in Israel. By the way, the military is also participating uh, as was mentioned by Mark, I used to be the head of epidemiology department in the IDF, and the military is, uh, uh, has lots of experience in doing sort of epidemiological studies. Uh, by the way, there are also uh, zero banks, uh, both in the military and also in the Israeli Center for Disease Control. So this can serve also in order to do the right, the, the question is how to do the right sampling in order that uh, all parts of all groups of Israel will be represented in terms of age, gender, uh, geography, uh, ethnicity, etc., and to find uh, uh, the right sample. 100,000 uh, tests in the case of Israel would be really enough. Uh, the, I'm sure this study would be <laughs> published uh, later because it's in, of importance for the whole world, not just for Israel. Thank you very much. A question for uh, Ellie. Ellie, turn on your microphone. Okay. You mentioned the, st the studies on the protein to help with diabetes 1. At what point can a drug be considered for production? Okay. Well, we, this uh, skipping between <laughs> panelists is weird. <laughs> uh, I, I see a lot of connection, but, but it's difficult to project it. So, we're, we're actually now at a watershed, watershed moment because the drug in general is already out there for another condition. This alpha-1 is actually available for a rare disease, another one. Uh, so in that respect, any physician is actually allowed to, to fill out the formalities and, and prescribe it. To become the scale that we would need then to give alpha-1 to patients with diabetes or bone marrow transplant recipients or any transplant recipients or uh, my dream which would be that any internal ward that accepts a, a patient will already give them by inhalation to the lungs alpha-1 to protect them from any infection in the area that that's a scale up that's huge uh, which means it's not so much about approval. It's just a matter of a matter of technology how to scale up this production and we do have our lab and, and some colleagues uh, some prototypes that are relevant for mar for larger production scale and they're patented and they're on their way to being uh, uh, lifted towards a bigger scale uh, That's that's work that, that uh, if anybody's interested you should connect with BGN technologies the the side of the university that works with uh, commercialization. But basically, it's, it's, it's a technical uh, leap. Thank you. Um, sure. So we'll go back to uh, Nadav on the public health. Uh, yes, we are going back and forth. Um, Nadav, your microphone, please. Um, on it's our uh, version of international ping pong. Exactly. Um, so there's a question from um, Montreal, Richard Levy, uh, the, uh, and it relates to a lot of people are concerned about uh, sending kids back to school. Um, it relates to a Jerusalem, a May 3rd Jerusalem report uh, stated that a, a new report on the plans to reopen schools 
following the lockdown suggests that doing so has the potential to increase the spread of the virus by 20%. The report further stated that it could be possible to reduce this increase to 10% by opening only lower classes as well as kindergartens. What do you think of that assessment? And uh, just to add that in, uh, in the province of Quebec, only elementary schools will be going back to, uh, to school and high school has been uh, canceled until uh, September. So this is actually one of the most interesting uh question and um, we know usually with the uh, upper respiratory infections that uh, children especially with influenza are sometimes termed as super spreaders um, and initially when we were dealing with uh, uh, COVID-19 the idea was that uh, maybe this is a situation with, with children it was quite clear that uh, Morbidity is extremely low among children. Uh, but the question was, what about infecting other people? And interestingly, and this is, uh, in, you know, in contrary to what we expected, we have now more and more studies around the world from uh, the Netherlands, from Belgium, from France, from Israel, that actually not only children are less infected, but they're also less infecting uh, others. Um, but this is mainly, this was mainly found between the age of one to 10. So probably the policy of opening first kindergartens and the elementary school is uh, wise. Um, but again, this answer is also very country specific because it's one thing to be now in, in Israel or and another thing now to be in Spain or, or in certain parts of Italy. And even within the country, you have different uh, regions. So for example, in Israel, while a Jewish school was open, uh, the Arab community decided because they got all the wave of uh, the pandemic uh, about two or three weeks later. So in some of the Arab villages now, there are a high infectivity rates in some of them, not, not all of them. Uh, so some of them decided not to open schools. So just to summarize, there is already uh, a scientific understanding that probably children are less infecting, they're infecting, but less infecting. Um, it's mainly between the age of one to 10. They're also uh, suffering from less severe uh, disease. Uh, and again, it really depends on the country, but I, I must say that if, again, we're taking into consideration that probably we're not going to have herd immunity or vaccine in the coming year, we need to continue this dance. So we need to start with the younger children to see what happened in if after several, uh, two weeks, if three weeks, four weeks, it, again, it really depends also on the testing system. Uh, and if things are still uh, under control, so even the, the, the raise of 20%, uh, you know, but you are relatively low numbers and you have enough ventilators. So now in Israel, we have only about 90 people being on ventilators and the capacity is several thousands. So that's uh, a, a chance that you can take because the, the price of keeping the schools closed for too long, um, it's also a, an emotional, a economic, and, and also public health a, a price. So you need to balance. So I think the getting out by first uh, having the younger children and then moving ahead uh, with the indicators that I mentioned, I think it's very wise. Thank you. Mark? Mark is muted for some reason. Let's, uh, Zach, if you can fix that, please. <laughs> Simon? Yes, you're oh, back on. Sorry. There you go. Okay. I keep pressing the wrong button. I'm, <laughs> not, a, I'm not a techie. We have uh, probably a time for one more question because we have three minutes, three and a half minutes max, because uh, then I want to close it up and uh, say a couple of things. Oh, okay. So there is one more question to, to Nadav, and you, uh, you, 
you broached a little bit the subject of the Arab community. There's a, more, a specific question about the the Bedouin community and how has the virus affected the Bedouin community? And uh, since uh, we're BGU and so close to the Bedouin communities of the Negev, it would be interesting to, to know. In, in two uh, minutes, you have to give it like a political scientist. So uh, we were working uh, very closely with the Bedouin community, uh, including with uh, religious leaders, I myself, at the beginning of uh, this whole event, I met with uh, uh, religious uh, leaders, and I must say that they were amazing in their response. Uh, they were using the mosque's uh, a system of announcement um, and close the mosques, and, and uh, also with the Ramadan. Uh, again, in general, uh, very good um, response. Um, we were also fighting to have uh, mobile testing units uh, to go also to the unrecognized uh, villages. So at the beginning there were problems and um, the rate of testing was quite low, but, but gradually this improved dramatically, especially when the Kupot Cholim, when the sick funds uh, enter. Uh, and what we have now that uh, there are some uh, local uh, outbreaks, uh, for example, in Khura that I mentioned, but uh, in general, um, we, have, uh, we had also the central table uh, in Tel Shomer controlling the whole situation. Uh, we were uh, in touch with them and bringing uh, the different uh, questions about Ramadan, about people that are tested and maybe they are the, like the ultra-Orthodox, because of the Ramadan, they don't want to go to the, uh, to the hotels. Uh, so lots of uh, uh, cultural sensitivities that uh, gradually we learn more and more. And I think it was a, uh, an amazing experience and uh, a point of strength that we'll I hope it will stay with us uh, after the Corona in terms of uh, all the civic society and the relationship with the Kupot Cholim, Soroka, and, and the universe and Ben Gurion University and the Faculty of Health Sciences and School of Public Health. Um, Eli and Nadav, I, this has been fascinating. It really has. I would say it's been the best webinar to date. Of course, I'm going to say that to each one. But this has been, I mean, the amount of questions that have not been asked, maybe we'll send them to you. You know what? Maybe we'll send them to you if you don't mind and you can answer them and then we will distribute them. So I'd like to officially thank you on behalf of the Canadian Associates of Ben Gurion University, whose website, www.bengurion.ca, I urge everyone on this call to uh, visit. Uh, next week, we, are, we have a surprise. We have a Lagba Omer webinar on Tuesday, not on Wednesday, on Tuesday, May 12th, and we're calling it Bonfires, Barbecues, and Bordeaux. Because if everyone knows, on Lag Bomer, you light bonfires, and you have barbecue, or mangal, as they say in Israel, and we have Professor Aaron Fett, uh, a, a vinicologist, an expert on wine from Ben Gurion, will be speaking, and his partner will be former Montrealer, Chef Shana goodman Sohn, who uh, is a very well-known chef in Montreal and now in Israel. She's also the president of the Goodman Foundation. And the two of them are going to be teaming up uh, with the live cooking demonstration. The week after that, on our regular webinar Wednesday, that will be uh, May 20th, we're going to feature, and I don't know if the people on the call are aware that the National Autism Center of Israel is situated at Ben Gurion University, and it is directed by uh, Dr. Elon uh, Dinstein, who is an outstanding, another outstanding researcher. I mean, really, with Eli Lewis, Nadav, uh, I, as I keep telling everyone, we are the jewel in the crown of Israeli educational institutions. We are, we are like that, that unknown, and people are starting to know us. So uh, Elon and his team will be featured at our we uh, webinar Wednesday, and speaking about uh, autism, children, their research, which is groundbreaking and uh, way ahead of the curve, I must say. So uh, without further ado, 12.59, 59 minutes, just under the wire. Rav Todot, thank you so much. And I have to tell everyone on the call, by the way, that my wife and I watch the Israeli news and Nadav is becoming a news personality. Uh, Eli, when he comes to, to North America, you can't get enough of him because everyone wants to speak 
with one of the world's greatest experts on diabetes. So thank you too for joining us and it was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Rav Todot, Toda Rabba. Thank you, thank everyone. You healthy. And, and stay tuned for our next webinars, please, everyone. Okay. Bye -bye.